I've long felt that there is a mythic quality to Michigan, this landscape surrounded by lakes large enough to be inland seas. And this is a place that is haunted by stories. In her new novella, Eden Springs, Laura Kozischke hones in on one of the strangest of them. In the early years of the 20th century, the utopian community called the House of David chose the lush land of Benton Harbor, Michigan to build its village and to wait an eternal life lived in the flesh. A bit of background on this. In 1903, the House of David community was, was founded by Benjamin Purnell, a charismatic preacher who was a good-looking and magnetic man um, who was sometimes called King Ben. All over the world, about a thousand people all together, and collectively they build a thriving community within the small Midwestern city of Benton Harbor. The House of David was trademarked by its big gorgeous houses, expansive orchards, extensive gardens, and its uh, world-famous zoo and amusement park that were open to the ticket-buying public. It also played host to nationally touring bands and fielded a very good semi-pro baseball team. Satchel Paige was actually hired to play for them. The baseball team drew widespread attention, not just because of their skill on the field, but also because of the curious sight of seeing these ball players uh, pitch and bat and run with their long, uncut hair and uncut beards. Believers also wore all white, they were vegetarians, and understood that sex was forbidden except, of course, between Benjamin Purnell and the women and girls he fancied, which, as it turned out, were quite a few of them. Ultimately, after an investigation by the Detroit Free Press, Purnell was tried in court for public immorality. Thirteen young women testified that Purnell had sex with them. Uh, Purnell was expelled from the House of David community in 1927, and he died a couple years later. His body was mummified and kept in a glass coffin in the House of David community, uh, for many years. Ultimately, after this, the House of David uh, community declined and fragmented. Laura Kozischke's novella situates itself just before the public scandal broke, when not only are the uh, pregnant unmarried girls drawing more than a few raised eyebrows, but there is a suspicious death. Remember, this is a colony that believed in the body not dying at all, which makes the moment especially tense in Eden Springs when the cheap coffin of a believer reported to be a 68-year-old woman slips beneath the shovel of a gravedigger and reveals a young teenage girl inside instead. And so begins the revelation of a cover-up and the mystery that trills through the pages of Eden Springs. Kozischke's book is built like a collage. Photos, legal documents, court testimony, news clippings, they're all set in the text about the House of David uh, alongside uh, Kozischke's fictional vignettes, which are told from the viewpoint of the colony's women and girls. At first I was nonplussed by this narrative strategy. It seemed as if Kozischke was merely using her words to illustrate the real-life ephemera about the House of David, rather than use them to build a unique story of her own. I was worried that the book was moving laterally, with all the momentum residing in the real-life stories of the House of David, rather than in Kozischke's variation on it. The risk of an elliptical work like this one is that it will spiral in on itself, circling its own tail, and never gaining any altitude of its own. And indeed, Eden Springs started slow for me. Ultimately, though, Kozischke's poetic and simple language propels a story outward and caught me in its spell. Consider. The he is Benjamin Purnell. Every afternoon, he'd come to visit us in the orchard, just as the sunlight was whitest, pouring itself into the air like milk into a glass of water, fluid strands, weightless as hair. We could hear the hooves of his horse before he reached us, the ground shaking as if something under it were being born. And by the time he got to us, we'd have our aprons straightened, the bows of our sun hats tied neatly beneath our chins. We wore white because it was cool, soothing to the bees, and because the wearing of black was forbidden. He taught us what to wear, what to eat, how to walk across the grass, beneath, between the trees, as softly as God walked on the earth, taking only what was needed or most desired, not even leaving a footprint behind us in the dust. So the bees didn't sting. They only circled the sweetness to smell it, and the sound of them was like the low drone of tiny, bright angels in our hair. And when Benjamin, our leader, smiled, the hard work seemed easy. He laughed at the palms of our hands staying red, and that white horse he rode bareback would paw impatiently at the ground. While suspense is built into this mystery of a 
a suspicious grave and a charismatic leader, Eden Springs also evokes prophecy of events foretold. Partly this is because of the news clippings and other detritus of real life that mark the pages of Eden Springs, giving it a sense of documentation and authority that plays against the imagined scenes. This energy, the dissonance between prophecy and suspense, is the engine that propels this novella. The reader is positioned so that we both know what happened, that this utopian co colony imploded and its believers are long gone, and we're hungry to know how it happened. I found myself wanting more of Kazishki's original writing. This spare 150-page novella is set off by a lot of white space, which accentuates the collage of the book, and in most ways this works. Its disjointed nature reconciles with the moment of the story when the House of David is on the brink of being unmoored. But I wish for a little more to hold on to. Maybe 30 or so pages more would have given Kasishki the opportunity to spend more time with her evocative ensemble of characters, and in turn give us readers the chance to better acquaint ourselves with the substance behind this fantastical story. Today, the shell of the House of David community still sits in Benton Harbor, Michigan. Empty Victorian mansions, a, an abandoned zoo, a silent amusement park. Decay is overtaking this place that once stood as a spiritual testament to decadence. Visitors today are the curious ones, the ones who are taken with the story, who see a crumbling ticket booth and hear the ghosts of the chattering, white-clad, long-haired believers from a century before. On this mythic tour, Kazishki is a worthy guide.